And welcome to The Link. The Link is a program all about linking you with the resources in your community. I'm Joni Wedler. Tonight is the second in a series of two shows that we did with the first company Governor's Horse Guard and Connecticut Military Cavalry Militia Unit. And joining us again are Sergeant Amanda Matava and Captain Gary Brooks, who told us a lot about the history. If you didn't catch part one, please look for it on our YouTube um, site for Nutmeg TV and you will enjoy that. We're gonna show you some additional historical pictures, but before we do that, let's talk about you both. So let's start with you, Captain. Uh, what drew you to this organization <coughs> and how long have you been serving? Uh, I've always liked horses. A friend of mine told me about the unit. I didn't know anything about it. I came up, I was impressed. Um, it uh, kind of brings you back in time mm -hmm. so that I wasn't able to live back in that era of the, the cavalry and the horses, but this actually made it uh, where I could act, partake and go back in time and be part of the cavalry. Mm -hmm. um, and I joined, actually it was, I came into the unit in 1971 I started the class in 72, so I had um, 27 years active, and then after that I went on staff, so altogether I've had 50 years with the unit. Oh, well, thank you so much for your service. That's a lot of years, and we were talking and during the break on how much things have changed, some for the good, um, and and most for the good, but some of, of the old, um, traditions uh, may have had to change because life changes, time changes, commitments change, uh, but that's a long time uh, to serve. And it's not just about putting on a uniform and riding a horse, is it? No, it's not. There's a lot of work that goes involved with it. Uh, we have uh, two work details a year. We maintain the property, we maintain the buildings, the barns, fixing fences. Uh, there's always something to do. It's, an actual, it's a working farm. It's a living, breathing entity. So there's a lot to do. And it's beautiful. Those of you who know where it is, uh, as you're driving towards Avon um, on West Avon Road, it's just beautiful. Uh, and you see the white fence, and that's kind of the depiction. And the horses are usually up near the fence, rolling around and <laughs> enjoying <Yes. laughs> the, the outside. And uh, Sergeant Matava, what drew you? How long have you been in? I joined the 2019 recruit class and I also have always loved horses and ridden horses. I lived in the area and we would drive by on our way downtown Avon to get dinner and um, my husband would point it out to me and say, oh, you know, that's a, you know, like a mounted police sort of a unit. I, I wonder if you could check it out because I know you want to start riding horses again. So I looked them up. I was shocked to see that anyone could join, regardless of military or horse experience, and that all I needed to do was show up on Thursday night and talk to some people and get a sense of what the unit was like and um, fill out some application paperwork. So I showed up on a Thursday night, saw what the unit had to offer. When I walked in the drill shed, there's just a ton of history around you. Um, going back to the 1700s, objects, pictures, and so I'm a history lover, I'm a trained archivist, that's my full-time job outside of the horse guards, and so I was fascinated by that. I didn't know that we had such a rich history, and then I met the horses, of course, and saw the barn and was immediately smitten with them, and so watching the unit ride, you know, out in formations on the field, it was like, okay, yeah, this is exactly right for me. Exactly yeah. right for yeah. her is yeah. right, I can <laughs> see that. So when you look to recruiting, and let's talk about people, and then we'll talk about horses, mm -hmm. what are you looking for? And you go back from when you were first joining and what they were looking for in, in you, and Sergeant Matava, what, what are you looking for in, in someone who wants to join? Back uh, when I first joined, uh, if you were uh, breathing, you passed your physical, uh, <laughs> you were accepted. 
uh, you were sworn in. Uh, but then you had to go through 16 weeks of basic training, and that was every Thursday and every Sunday. Um, and you were taught equitation, horsemanship, uh, marching, uh, the weapons, military discipline, military order, uh, close order drill. Uh, and as long as you didn't fall off the horse, mm -hmm. uh, most times uh, you were accepted and you got more training as your time went on when you went into the riding platoon. Okay, and so it took a while until you were riding yeah. and you had to meet those benchmarks or they were gonna say, uh, hey, wait a minute, you didn't show up or you're not pulling your weight or you didn't follow instruction. Well, if you missed, uh, I believe it was uh, four, four drills, mm -hmm. you're automatically dismissed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, automatically. Yep. Uh, if you didn't pass the final testing mm -hmm. with the equitation, you're automatically dismissed. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. you then you would have to uh, go through the process again mm -hmm. uh, for your equitation for the safety of yourself, the horse, and other people around you. Other people around you. And so now, Sergeant Matava, what are you looking for? What what would be the candidate that you would look to bring in? So in a sense, we sort of still follow the same uh, protocols, bringing people in, um, you know, between the ages of 18 and 60, don't need prior military experience, you don't need prior horse experience, we teach all of that to you during recruit training. And so if you can make it through recruit training, some recruits, you know, get partway through and decide this isn't really for me after all, um, which is totally fine. Um, and some make it through and pass, you know, the final uh, equitation ride, which is an examination of your skills that you've learned. Um, you know, someone who loves horses is not a requirement, but you know, we get those sorts of people. We get people that are interested more in the unit and. Usually what we find are with really great people is they, they have something they want to bring to the unit to bring it forward. They see themselves as part of continuing the unit and its history, um, but also enjoying sort of the day-to-day -day work and challenges that come with it, and the fun, of course, um, and the horses. But um, people who sort of see themselves as sort of a piece of a bigger picture mm -hmm. and you know using their individual talents to better the unit mm -hmm. um, that's definitely very important a great thing. yeah and bringing an organization forward and continuing that mm -hmm. to go forward and so besides the friends who um, do the friends get involved with acquisition or at, uh, of, of, uh, of recruits recruits no no but they, they do of horses yes and uh, not really not really uh, the Friends basically is a, uh, a fundraising. It's a nonprofit. Yep. Arm. Uh, 501c3. Yep. So people can make donations to the Friends of the Horse Guard. Okay. Uh, basically, for this specific purpose, we don't get horses donated any longer, unfortunately. And we have to purchase our own horses. So the expense of actually going out and buying horses. Yeah, it's very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah. How many horses do you have now? We have 10 horses. And I would like to add that people can donate horses to us. We just, it's been, you know, tough with the recession and with COVID, I mean, um, with horse ownership. And so, you know, economic times are hard. So there aren't, there isn't an abundance of people donating horses to us. Right. And what yeah. kind of animal are you looking for? Do you test the horses before they come in to yes. make sure that, because I would imagine we're going to show some pictures, uh, let's do that now, of uh, some of the parades. Uh, we're looking, actually, this is in Washington. This is 1957. Captain Brooks, do you want to tell us about this? Well, it's this Eisenhower's inauguration. We were allowed to take uh, nine horses uh, to Washington. And that continued for quite a few years, uh, up until I'd say maybe the 80s. Uh, that's Hartford, going under the Veterans Arch in Hartford. It's a beautiful picture, and that's 1973. Uh, yeah, and at that time we had approximately 39 horses in the unit. Almost, yeah, yeah triple. Mm -hmm. Triple. Triple. Um, so we were on the go with parades, Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, they've called us to Washington for Fourth of July parades besides the inaugurals. Uh, and that's now under the arch again. 
uh, Veterans Arch in uh, Hartford. That was 1975, Governor Ella Grasso. Uh, so right about that time, and then again in 1999, the Governor's Horse Guard down in Iantic. Um, so when you, when you talk about it, animals coming in. You also have to have the recruit the bodies, the the militia ready to handle uh, these animals. You can't do it with a small group. You have to be able to have a balanced uh, but let's go back to the horses a sure. minute. So what to be able to be in those parades and to be able to be around loud sounds or you know a siren that fires up or a clapping of a crowd, uh, what kind of horse are you looking for? Generally, uh, we used to have a lot of Morgans. We had some standard breads. Mm. Uh, we had some thoroughbreds. We didn't have too good luck with thoroughbreds because of the legs and so forth. Uh, but we had uh, Arabs, quarter mm. horses, uh, so a variety. A variety. Uh, I wouldn't uh, think Arabs and Morgans would be on your list. Uh, definitely Morgans. Mm -hmm. um, Arabs, we, we took them. Uh, they were smaller horse. Mm -hmm. But at that time, because they were donated, we can't be choos too choosy. Uh, but do, what kind of training program do they go through when they first come in? On your Facebook page, mm -hmm. there's a new horse that came in. Yes. And it's like, OK, you better <laughs> rest up, because tomorrow you start training. Well, they mm -hmm. go through 90 days, but yep. I'll let the sergeant. Yeah. Um, so we will basically take a, a gelding. They have to be a gelding. Um, you know, of, uh, I don't think we specify age, but you know, of a good age, sound, no major ish, uh, injuries or sickness, any sort of chronic issues, um, brown, black, or bay in color is preferable, and um, between 15 and 17 hands usually. So when they arrive, they go under, they undergo at least a 90 day trial. Sometimes that can be extended if necessary, but we get them accustomed to all of the routines that a cavalry horse in our unit would undergo. So being tied to the picket line, getting groomed in our specific sort of way, getting accustomed to the people. Um, if their ground manners are not good and they're pushy and you know a little rude, we train that out of them. We work with them consistently. We have a cadre of people that are really talented horse people, and they have spent many weeks with our newest horses, um, training them and getting them used to being in the unit. And that starts from the ground and then goes you know slowly towards having them ride alongside the unit and drill. You know, at first not really participating, just being near the other members of the herd. And then at the same time, on the other side, they have to get used to the other horses in the herd, getting accustomed to them by being in an introductory paddock, um, making sure everyone getting along, and then eventually they're kind of phased into being part of the bigger herd and you know turnout and everything. So they're kept kind of separate, undergoing individual training. But after about 90 days, and then the training you know will continue on after mm -hmm. that. Once we accept them as part of the unit you know, their training keeps going so that the consistency and the training sinks in and it stays with them. Now, while they're being trained, when new recruits come in, they also have to be trained in your manner of horsemanship. Correct. Correct. We do everything the way the cavalry did it. Mm -hmm. Oh, you do that the same way too? Your horsemanship is based on the cavalry style. Cavalry manual. Yes, cavalry manual. Mm -hmm. that's, our, that's our Bible. The, the way the cavalry did it is the way we do it. Um, we still show our video, mm -hmm. training videos from 1942, the actual cavalry. So this is what the recruits actually watch, our uh, training videos, 1942, uh, and they're actually doing everything the cavalry did. So when the... When someone comes in, like you just talked about being a horse person, mm -hmm. and when you came in and said, okay, I, I've been a horse person, or you uh, were interested in horses, you may have your own idea of what you've learned and how to handle, so that all changes according to the cavalry way. Forget what you learn. And, and has, is that model of training still a very good one, apparently, because you're following it? For yeah. the cavalry? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If it worked for them. Mm -hmm. It worked for them. Um, so I saw on your Facebook page there was a bean bag, mm -hmm. and a, you know a, a cornholer as they call yeah. them, and <laughs> and somebody had the horse and somebody was dropping 
this into the hole, and I imagine it was for the sound or, mm. or and, and to see that have have that horse stand still. Yeah, we were playing some games, so it was fun, but it was also to get the horses used to some new objects and activity. Um, you know, throwing a bean bag off of the back of your horse into a hole that might make a loud noise. Um, picking, you know, being able to bend from your horse down to scoop water out of a bucket and then dump it into another bucket. You know, trot your horse down the fields. Also being able to handle your horse out on his own, um, you know, independently of the rest of the herd. And um, some other things, I think we had uh, um, some lacrosse balls that we were throwing into big horse water buckets as well. So just some new activity. Um, we also practiced, you know, riding in close order by holding some toilet paper in between us that couldn't rip, you know, so we were riding in what we call twos and you have to stay very close together. Um, one of our horses was not a fan of the toilet paper. As soon as he saw it, he was like, I don't think so. But after some exposure, he was, he was fine. So it's all really good to get uh, the horses used to all kinds of new things that you know are everyday objects to us and we don't think anything of it. But one of the first things we teach the recruits, especially those who haven't been around horses, are that they're prey animals. They're very large and they could hurt you by accident, but they won't on purpose but that those prey instincts will, you know, they'll kick in. So, you know, things that are kind of everyday nature to us, walking, talking, objects, whatever, could be very scary to them at first. Yeah, and then the reaction will occur. Yeah. And now you have a trailer. I, I remember seeing a bright and shiny, beautiful trailer for taking these animals to large events like the... Um, parades that we saw. Uh, do you take them routinely out when there's not parades? Will you trailer them, get them used to that? You mentioned going to the beach, a recent outing. You want yeah. to tell us about that? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's, you know, too routine, but it's something that we do like to do, you know, a few times a year. Um, also in the spring, I believe a, cu a couple of our troopers took a, just two horses down to one of the elementary schools for sort of like, you know, we just had the horses there tacked and, you know, the kids could meet them and and they were in uniform. Um, but we did take the horses down to Hammonasset last year, and I think we're gonna do so again this year. They'd never been down to the beach. They'd been to Niantic um, and, and whatnot for training, but just to ride on the beach and to have kind of a nice time, but just also be in a new environment, which is also really beneficial for them. It is. Captain Brooks, what is about Niantic, and how does Niantic fit in with the Avon property? Uh, Niantic is the National Guard uh, camp uh, base. I believe now it's for MPs. Uh, other units, it's, it's a trans, it used to be a transition camp. If you were going overseas, you'd be coming into this camp here for your training and getting ready to go overseas. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we used it every year for our annual training. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, which you still do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do annual yep. training every year. Uh, so we take the horses. Uh, it's an overnight bivouac. We used to uh, put all of the, all the equipment goes on the saddle, and we told them how to use it and how to, how it goes on. Uh, each person gets a half a tel half a tent, a shelter half mm -hmm. that's rolled up a certain way with your blanket inside, with your tent pegs and your rope. It's rolled up, and then that's placed on the back of the saddle and tied down. Your saddle bags are on there. Your raincoat is tied to the front. Your rifle scabbard goes on the side. And your rifle stays off until you're getting ready to mount. Uh, as soon as you, when you're getting ready to mount, the rifle will go in. As soon as you dismount, the rifle comes out in case the horse takes off. But it's set up just the way the cavalry had it in 1942 and prior in 1936 and going back into the 20s. Mm -hmm. And so when you're there training, are you doing uh, drills, you doing, how about physical fitness? We have um, done some physical fitness, especially this year. We've done some physical challenges like rucking with weight on your back. We have our trails on the property, so we used those to march. Um, we did a four mile ruck with weight. Everything that we do is extremely physical. We encourage fitness outside of the horse guards as well. For example, we mount from the ground. So that takes a little bit of flexibility and strength. Um, we also, and riding a horse, it takes an incredible yes. amount of strength. So, you know, all of that 
sort of thing, um, marching for long periods of time as well, um, especially in parades, hot weather. Hot uh, weather. Yeah. Um, when we train down in AT, it's primarily on horseback. We do drills, we do equitation, we do sorts of little challenges, we do all kinds of different things that maybe we don't normally do or have time to do. Um, for example, doing clover leafs in twos and fours. So what that means is, you know, you've seen barrel racers go through the barrels. We do that, but we do it four across. Um, you know, so everyone has to ride together and make the turns, and there's a specific sort of way that each horse has to speed up or slow down to make it uniform, um, that sort of thing. When you look at horsemanship, if people come and say, I really want to be a member, but mm -hmm. I have never ridden a horse before, how have you seen the training change from when you started and you were doing it to now? Do people pretty much just watch what other people are doing, get their lesson of what they need to do, and it really comes naturally to them after time, after following the, the routine, or no? It, uh, I don't think that's changed much. No. Even if you don't know what you're doing, or have never been on a horse, mm -hmm. we start from basics, mm -hmm. day one. A1. Um, and uh, we teach you the safety around the horse. We teach you how to groom a horse. There's a certain way he's groomed. Mm -hmm. What side first, what side second. Feet first, grooming first, uh, saddling, bridling. It's all um, repetition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just Is this repetition. English, English riding? Um, it's cavalry style, so it's actually slightly different from English, but English would be the closest thing. Mm -hmm. And we treat everyone exactly the same when we're teaching them how to groom and ride because, again, going back to like people with horse experience, we now have to relearn a new way of doing everything. So sometimes that old muscle memory kicks in, but that's not exactly the way the cavalry does it, um, which was the case with me. I'm like, oh yeah, I know how to do all this stuff, but I have to now kind of unlearn and then relearn a new process. So really everyone's sort of starting from a similar point. Um, I hadn't ridden in quite a few years before I came to the horse guard, so there were things that I remembered I could generally ride, but you know, it was kind of also a learning process. A new learning process. Yeah. So when um, you're state funded, because you're a state organization, uh, and so do you have to go every year and meet with the state, and how does that work? How is your funding, are you under the military? We're under the military uh, department. Mm -hmm. um, when you join our unit, you are in the military. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, part of the organized militia state of Connecticut. Yes. Uh, directly under the National Guard and the Adjutant General. Yes. We take all our orders from, from downtown the military department. Um, as far as the funding, they basically wanted us to, uh, we have our stable, we have a caretaker, which the state maintainer is paid, the state military pace for the, that. We have our facility, our main uh, drill shed uh, building uh, with lights and heat that's paid for through the military department. As far as everything else right now, they were basically trying to get us to be self-sufficient mm. and it's a little difficult um, trying to raise money for horses and everything else to be self-sufficient. Right, absolutely, mm -hmm. especially when you're expected to maintain certain levels, and, and that takes a whole lot on its own to maintain mm -hmm. th those certain levels. But uh, the history and the continuation of this wonderful organization to continue forward, I think, uh, Sergeant Matava, you had it right when you are looking for people whether, and, and folks don't have to want to ride, they could want to do other things. Correct. Um, other mm -hmm. volunteer things, um, even helping out at the property or friends or any of these other uh, initiatives uh, to be part of the group uh, is very important in moving it forward and keeping it, keeping it alive because mm -hmm. it's much more than ceremonial. But boy, I'll tell you, when you see the ceremonial, it's very, you know, you feel such a sense of pride as a Connecticut resident to know that this organization is here and has mm -hmm. been here for so long. So thank you so much for being with us and we hope yeah. that you come back and provide some more history. There's so much we had to go through, uh, just so many different files uh, that Captain Brooks brought to us 
to determine which ones we were going to show you, and uh, there's there's just so much. It would be a history lesson in itself. So uh, please do come back. And for all of us at Nutmeg TV, until the next link, I'm Joni Wendler. Have a good day.